Hi, welcome to our talk. I'm your host, Jim Tripp, in the spirit of art. Today we have uh, with us Christiane Corbett from Warren, Rhode Island, a sculptor, a sculptress. And we're going to be following a piece through in, in the construction and building and commissioning of it. I'd like to welcome you, Christine. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so where do we start here as far as commissioning a piece? Uh, how does this happen? I used to do commissioned pieces. This piece here, for instance, is a commissioned piece. But I found that at one point, the, what the person needed from that piece, how it had to look for them, mm -hmm. got in the way of the image that I wished to create. And recently, I've gone about it a very different way. I go up to someone who inspires me, and I say, something about you is very special, very inspiring for me. Would you allow me to do a piece about you? So that gives you the freedom of That's choice. That's right. That's right. And then if what is sometimes that person will buy the piece, but mm -hmm. if not, it has a life of its own. It goes on to be shown someplace and maybe bought by someone else. Right. It has its own meaning. That's right. Its own direction. Without that uh, monetary uh, vice, should I say? Well, I don't know if it's always a vice, but it really frees me up. and. Uh, you're very used to doing commissioned work, and you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I do not. And I have chosen at this time to do it another way. Well, I can understand about the commissioning. It gets very tough because mm -hmm. so many people, as far as portraiture, portrait busts, things like that, you have other people coming in looking at it. That's right. And deciding whether they like it or not. And everyone sees someone different. So you have five people, five different opinions. Yes. And they can get really hairy. And you just sit there and sweat while everybody talks about the work. Well, this helps a lot. It also allows the person to be an active part. Uh, they can say whatever they want. And then at one point I say, this is going to be about. <clears throat> and it may be a quality that they have. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely about, <clears throat> excuse me, about that thing. So you spend some time <clears throat> with them. And as, the time, as you work in and... and you decide what exactly you want to portray of that person? Well, if we could take this particular piece and just go through how it was done, it's really quite um, characteristic of the way I work. Okay. This is a piece about Sharon Griffiths, and I met her. Uh, I was intrigued by her presence. All right. That was the first thing. Also her coloring and just a way of dignity about her. And I thought, well, that's interesting, and I like that. Then I found that she had a whole different side to herself, which had to do with being extremely well organized, uh, working with people very well, a practical business side that was very developed. Mm -hmm. And I found that interesting, that there were these two sides of her. They were equally strong. And in my mind, I started seeing something that was double, the way this woman has a double feature to her portrait. But I didn't know what direction to take. So I asked Sharon, would you be willing to do a piece with me? And she thought it over. And she finally said yes. Now, in the beginning, we talk. Right. And I had a preconceived idea that the way to connect with her and, and the image was through the idea of time. I did extensive reading on time. Why time? Because I felt that uh, it was intuitive, but I just felt that she had a concept of time that was not the same uh, as mine or as everybody else's, and that there was something for her to say about this. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, it wasn't the right thing. No. And uh, in speaking to her and going over 
the, my ideas about time that I had gleaned from the quantum physics and everything that I had been reading, I realized that this wasn't where this was supposed to go. And I just took it uh, as a, all right, well, you know, that's fine. We make mistakes. When did you realize this? I think after I cast her. I brought it back to the studio and I just let the piece speak for itself. Okay, so and in a sense, what happened is... So as is, time went by... As time went by, <laughs> it worked in our favor. And what I did is I knew intuitively that I wanted to cast her twice. And this helped a great deal because what eventually happened is a piece I call Reflection. And I took, uh, as we will see, I cast her two times with your help and your mother's help. And then I put these together and I wrote her a letter saying, I'm seeing this image as though you were coming out of dark water. And as you come out, your reflection is growing as you grow. And I, I like the idea that the water was around. That has stayed with the piece, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. I liked that there were two of her and that it was a balanced piece. It's, it's about the center of balance. It's about someone who has more than one side. And these are in balance. So centering in time. Perhaps, although I just finished another piece that I called Centering in Time, so really? it can't be that one. But I, I did something just here that was um, interesting to me. I looked up the word reflection in the dictionary, mm -hmm. and I found that it is to cast back from a surface, and certainly we did cast her surface, to be turned or cast back as light or heat, to give back or show an image, and to ponder or meditate. The quality of meditation about this piece was also strong, and that's why I want to call it reflection and not reflections. Well, I think you've captured that reflection aspect of it. And, and I, I do think it covers time, because when I see the piece, uh, I see time, but I see past time up to the present. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of different things. It's very hard to explain. But I see the reflection and the centering of it all, the way the piece is hung and held. Um, and you have no idea what you're going to do beforehand. You, before you, you take the cast and you bring it back to your studio and well, just let it happen. Well, I had an idea, happen. but it didn't work out. And so I just kept, I put it in position, in different positions in my studio and I live with it for a few days. I look at it every day. And it starts telling me, no, don't do this to me. You know, this isn't right. Or yes, now you've got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I had built it so that there was an actual stand and there was a feeling of gravity that I didn't want for the piece. It was too grounded. It was too grounded. Okay. She's grounded to herself, like the axis uh, in the middle of the earth. Mm -hmm. But the earth is hanging in space. And I wanted this to be suspended. And so just before the two of you came up to my studio, I just said, you've got to try it. You'll never know visually if this works unless you do it. And so I got ladders and everything and put it on the wire so that I could make it suspend and float in the air. Floating in time. Floating in time. For me, it's that moment. It's the present moment. You speak about the past, and I think that's, it's, that's also there. Right. But for me, she's in the present moment. Okay. Uh, why don't you set this up for us? Uh, we're going to Sharon's house. Yes. And... This, uh, we're going to see the actual molding of the, of the person. Okay. And uh, in her case, I had the help, the, uh, had your help and her mother's help, which mm. was... Which was fun. Which was wonderful. Now, what are you it using a lot. Uh, for the cast? I'm using a material that's cotton. It's just a, a fiber that has been impregnated with uh, the um, plaster. Plaster. And when I moistened it, I can put it on whatever shape I want, and it will dry in that shape. Excellent. So it takes a perfect cast. It takes, off the and instead of making a mold from that, I use the actual thing. Okay. Well, why don't we go to Sharon's house? Yes.
Welcome back to our talk. What you've just seen is uh, Christian Corbett taking a cast off of Sharon Griffiths. And that was funny. Uh, it looked like she was a stone there for a minute. So where do you go from there? I took those pieces back in my car and I brought them to my studio. And the elegance of her classical lines became very evident to me. And it started influencing me on what the finished piece would look like. There is a Renaissance artist called Francesco Lorana, and I went to get all of the uh, photographs of his work that I could because a friend of mine who had come in to the studio had said, you know, this looks just like a Francesco Lorana. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she was right. Very classical lines, very, yes. very classical. And one of the funny things that happened is that we cast her looking up, but when I got her to my studio, I found that she was really reflecting upon herself. Just and I down. loved that because that's what the piece became. You took a number of casts, two full casts. Two full, of one the of the torso. two fronts and two backs. And you put them together back at the studio. Yes, and I do that with acrylic medium and then more plaster. And there are several coats of plaster and paper and paint that go on the, the uh, surface of this. this finish, to finish <laughs> it off. Yes. Now, how long did that take? Well, the casting uh, took us most of that uh, day, uh, several hours, although from start to finish, the casting of one piece would take maybe half an hour. So mainly it's all preparation, and once you start putting that plaster on, it's fast. And Ooh. then when I get to the studio, it can take weeks, months. I've worked on some pieces as much as a year. So you just have to keep looking at, looking at it and feeling it out. Till it depends whether the image is really strong that I can uh, make, because I work not all artists do this, and this is just the way I, it, it happens for me. I do see the image inside, and it does change as I go along, but it helps me a great deal to know what that image should look like so I can match it outside of myself. Now, do you have a lot of contact with the person you're doing in between? Sometimes I write them, as I did Sharon, or call them. I tell them what's happening, and I take photographs and send them to keep them involved in the process. And also, if I'm making a big mistake, I want to know. Now, when you... <coughs> Did this, is this where the piece changed? The, ch the piece changed as I listened to it. As you listened to it. As it was in my studio. So uh, as you made it, uh, did it really start to change there? Yes, as in my studio, okay, definitely. You, when you brought it home. And I think okay. it reflects, if you don't mind the pun, I think it does uh, reflect Sharon and her qualities better than my original idea of time. Oh. So well, I'm very good. pleased with that. It's good, the weight, <clears throat> the patience. Right. Patience <laughs> is additive. Okay, well, we're going to have to go to a commercial break, and then we'll come back and go back to, to your studio. is a process that fills our lives. See it. Enjoy it. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Griffiths Arts Center, New London, Connecticut. 
Welcome back to Art Talk. We're here with Christiane Corbett from Warren, Rhode Island, a sculptress, and we're, we're in the middle of casting a piece. So where do we go from here? In the studio, uh, I think I've talked a little bit about the preparation, that that surface gets a great deal of attention. I don't like to leave it just plaster. Okay. That has a, a kind of a dead quality that I don't like. It does have a dead. In sculpting, um, the clay is life, plaster is death. That's right. And bronze is immortality. So that is a very tough stage. You can't see into it. Well, what I do is I layer things on top of the plaster so that there's a depth. On other pieces, I've put as many as 50, 50 coatings. coatings. Yes. Of what? Uh, shellac, lacquer, uh, paint? Uh, um, acrylic mediums and papers and paints. Papers, other papers. And also, uh, I make my paints transparent w by using the, that uh, liquid um, medium, that uh, acrylic medium. Okay. Well, like this piece over here, on one side of it you have a uh, beehive. Yes. So you use all kinds of different I, papers. I use all kinds of papers. That's right. Uh, the natural papers, uh, even, do you know on the palm tree, the palm fiber? Mm -hmm. That makes absolutely gorgeous covering. Really? And there are many Japanese papers. This one has um, some marks in it, the water paper, the, the marks. The paper itself. Itself. And I use that as well. So it absorbs the paint differently, so it has texture? Yes. Okay, so that's what you're looking for, is texture. Yes, and and uh, for that piece, I wanted it to look a little bit like marble. I felt that the the Loranas had a, a kind of grace and uh, classical beauty that I wanted also to be inspired by and use in my piece. Capture. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, we're going up to your studio again soon, so why don't you set us up with that? One of the materials that I use in many pieces is the uh, animal intestine. And uh, <laughs> it captures light very beautifully when, when you have it uh, opened up. And you're going to see how I actually work with it with my hands and, and turn it into the, the art. Where do you find work. animal intestine? I just go to a meat market or someplace like that where it sells. <laughs> Does that give the... You buy a shank or a hank, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Does that give people the creeps? Yes, yeah. but it's a very nice substance to work with. It's got a beautiful texture. Similar to paper. Yes. When it's stretched. A velvety paper. Really, very thin. Very thin. It's like parchment. Well, they make instruments with... That's right. You make a banjo yeah. head with uh, this kind of thing. Okay. All right, well, what do you, what do, you do with it? You use the sticks. I, I know the piece is really changing shape at this stage. And well, you use, I made, use vine? I made the uh, bittersweet vine construction, and then I laid the animal intestine over it. And, and tied it to itself. Okay. And that part is, um, is made separately. And then I put the two pieces of Sharon's bust, one on top and one below. That must have shocked Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's head up to your studio then and look at it.
I've always loved everything that comes from nature and it's led me to some unusual places. This is animal intestine. I buy it at a, at a meat market or a, a supermarket and I find that it has a wonderful quality of luminescence and you can see it's translucent and it, it just it has little lines all through it. It's very, very beautiful. I could never make something as beautiful as this. And that's the same reason that I use the wasp nest and all the other the feathers and so on. What I do is I take it, it comes, the intestine comes um, all linked together. I cut off the size piece that I want. I stretch it on my fingers and then I cut it open so that I get a flat piece. And you can see that it's got a all these beautiful vein-like, uh, parchment-like um, designs on it. And then, because of its viscosity, it will adhere to itself or to other natural materials. And I stretch it over. I've made this wooden structure. And I just put it over it. Now, this, this piece is something that I would like to be part of the reflection piece and uh, I'm going to show you where I hope this will go on it. My idea was to make something that co uh, brought together the part that's here, the, the sort of the, uh, the lotus blossom or the water lily with the the top of the head and so I made it out of the same material and I'm not sure that this, this is really the right shape yet but it's one idea so far Christiane this is an incredible piece I love it it's so light airy it's floating the minute I saw it, it just reminded me of a uh, renaissance. Well, there just is a... screamed renaissance. Well, it's funny you say that because there is a specific artist from uh, the mid-15th century whose name is Francesco Lorana, who uh, made busts of women, especially women, that were very pure in line the way this particular profile is. And uh, I, w I was, as soon as I saw how this piece was progressing, I went out to the library and I got a number of uh, photographs of his pieces. Mm -hmm. I wanted that uh, marble, those marble statues to kind of echo what was going on here. And they're very contemplative pieces. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I like about it. And I think that this piece is about contemplation. I call it reflection, reflection. which is the, the two. It's reflected one onto the other. You mm -hmm. don't you know, this piece is reflecting into that and so on. But it is also the moment of reflection. But even the work, the outside uh, circumference, well, this is all, it reminds me of uh, Leonardo's, the wings of his glider. I love the wings. And it just, it just strikes me in that era so, so much. Well, I wanted it to float. You used that word before. And I finally had to string it from the ceiling because I had made a stand that didn't quite work. It, it just grounded didn't ground it too it, much. Right. Didn't, it didn't pull it out. And the feathers, I don't know if the camera can pick the feathers up on the inside. Gives that ethereal uh, blending where the two, two come together, it just mixes. And plus the bird, the, the attitude of the bird and the flight. Ah, it's, it's beautiful. Well, maybe I'm going to take this off and maybe... Well, yeah, before you take that off, why don't we ask Sharon to come around here. Oh, that's a and, good idea. And stand. Yep, that's yeah, almost like a Rodin. <laughs> I'm not mic'd up, so you won't be able to hear me. So okay, I'll stand closer to you then. Hopefully, your mic will work. Well, I'm honored that Christiane was interested in doing a piece for me. Um, I saw her work in her studio, and it was both frightening and exciting to see someone else's interpretation of who I am reflected through their eyes. Um, so I'm just waiting to see how the final piece is going to come out. I think it's coming out great. Well, one of the really things, intriguing. one of the qualities that I wanted to capture is I believe that you have a kind of poise 
that is reminiscent of these uh, beautiful women who are standing in these aristocratic and mysterious ways in mm -hmm. the, the uh, Renaissance art. And that's definitely something that I thought I could bring out in this piece. It's very much like you, so. Very mysterious woman. <laughs> well, I'm told to take my glasses off and turn this way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so and right. now I'll go back to the camera so you can finish talking about how this was made and why it's suspended the way it is and what's going on. All right. Thank you. Well, the, as I work on a piece, uh, as a work in progress, it takes on qualities of its own, and many times the, the piece itself will almost speak to me and say, you need to be working on this, or you need to develop this side of it more. As this became, uh, the two heads reflective, uh, looking at each other, thinking, you know, this, this was a top and a bottom, a yin, a yang, mm -hmm. uh, all of these things, um, I realized that it needed to float. Well, fine, it also needed to do other things, the reflection quality. Just today, uh, that aspect of it um, developed as we started to talk, and I said, well, let's put a mirror underneath it. I've always wanted to do a piece with the water under the here yes. to reflect the piece and make it a true reflection. But then... You really give it that uplifting... Exactly. Yes. But then uh, this circular, cir this shape here, I thought, well, maybe we could echo that down on the floor, mm -hmm. and there could be canted mirrors as well as the one in the center, and those could reflect on an angle so that anywhere Multiple that you walked, reflections. you know, you'd, you'd feel the piece not only from here, but from down there. Almost like a ripple in a pond, well, reflective. Well, very much like that. And the experience that I had, and usually when I have an experience that relates to the piece, the piece is much better because I can make it also about me. Well, that's what you said before. You said uh, your pieces are about you. They are. As much as I, I get inspired by either someone the beauty else. or the story of someone else's life, if I don't have a relationship to that, I can't really work on it. Right. And in this case, I was working on a piece with uh, a fellow artist, Robert Blake, and we went to a place in, um, in southern Rhode Island that had, had an Indian massacre on it. Our mm -hmm. idea was that art can transform, uh, re-sanctify uh, something that has been desecrated by humankind. And we spent the day there, and we then made pieces that were in a big show that we had. But I went back by myself, and the experience that I had there was contemplating a, an area where the swamp that we went to mm -hmm. had water and I looked into the water and I suddenly saw the sky and the trees above reflected and as I stayed there for quite a while the world reversed mm -hmm. and the reflection became the reality and the reality became the reflection this is what I want this piece to be about this is what I'm working on True here reflection. And, uh, and, and there's a quality of not knowing which is the real world, which I love, because they're both real to me. Now, your piece is so made out of so many uh, different things, this mixed media. Uh, can you explain a little bit of it? Well, I do the body casting because I find that um, using real life, the real person, the real Sharon, Takes was... the essence of? It t is helpful, is extremely helpful. And um, she has something that I can't duplicate. It needs to be her. Right. And then the, the use of the animal intestine, I did because life is about the emotions of the gut. Uh, and so I symbolically use it for that. And also because there's so much light when we have it properly lit. This yes, thing should just, just glow. Yeah. And the feathers, for the same reason, they have a quality of capturing light that nothing else that I, you know, these little white down feathers. Yes, they have a softness that nothing else has. And the flax, which is a natural material. Yes, and this is bittersweet vine, which again, yeah, very you know, life has yeah. bittersweet qualities. Very grounded to it. in it, floating but grounded into itself. But it's very much about the self, uh, understanding the self. This is a piece about balance. Okay. For me, this is a place of balance, a place of the present moment. A centering? A centering, yes. And many of my pieces are about that. I, I like that. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing to, to try to achieve visually. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, very pleasing to the eye. Yeah. All right. And now one of the, 
things that I very much enjoyed about doing this piece was that uh, when we cast Sharon, her brother and her mother were part of it. And it was not only a pleasure to meet them, but to have another artist working with me. And as an artist, I wanted to ask you, Jim, if you feel that this portrait of Sharon speaks about her in some specific way. Uh, definitely. I definitely think it, you've captured... Well, you, I know you're not done yet, but I think you've captured quite a few things here from what I can see. Uh, knowing Sharon growing up, uh, she came from a very uh, natural place, mm -hmm. a very nature-oriented. Our parents were very nature-oriented. We spent a lot of time in the woods and camping. And, and to have that coming out of, out of the middle of the piece between the two reflections, because I see her now and I, I see who she used to be. Mm -hmm. But as her centering, uh, its nature was her center. And it all comes out and, and around. And she's gained her wings, so to speak. And, and it really it pulls that out. It pulls through. And, uh, and the overall um, uh, Renaissance appearance, that's where I picture her. Oh, I think you've good. captured it quite accurately. You've captured a nice piece of her. Yes, I think you've got it. Welcome back. This is Art Talk, and we've just visited Christiane Corbett's studio in Ro Warren, Rhode Island. And I have some questions for you. <laughs> I w the pieces you make are so fragile and delicate between the, uh, the wood and the, the gut, and it's just, you could see through everything. What, what about the longevity? You mean, does it last? Does it last? I know sculptors are always doing things that carry on forever. The bronze, the stone, mm -hmm. I mean, they're really into that foreverness. A uh, piece of their own ego, maybe, to last. I don't know. Well, I have a different philosophical way of looking at this. Uh, I always tell people that my work has a lifetime guarantee, just like you and me. Mm -hmm. And that um, because I use natural things, it it's a message that time is fleeting, yes, it that is. things change, that things are constantly changing. Now, <clears throat> on some of these pieces with the feathers, underneath Sharon there are a whole group of white feathers. Eventually those will <clears throat> have to be changed. But I think that's all right. You know, I, th it, my art is about process. My art of, is about the living moment, living the life. Instant. And so Spontaneous. In a sense, it has to, to be involved with the materials of life, and those do deteriorate eventually. Yes, they do. But do you have any uh, problems as far as uh, galleries or studio? You know, as, as a it hasn't show? come up that much, though some people do ask me, you know, if I buy this, you know, how long is it going to last? I always tell them not to leave it in a sunlit window, but then you wouldn't put a good painting in a sunlit window right. either. This is not art that belongs outdoors. Okay. Um, but just, there are a whole, there are many artists who work with even more ephemeral things than I do. Mm -hmm. They make things that last only for a week or even less. Yes. And that's the point of their art. I think that th the idea behind this is enough important to me so that I won't change materials. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's longer lasting than the installation art. That's true. Because it comes and goes. So it does have that. It's right in between somewhere. Actually, I, I have done installation art, and it appeals to me because it's only there for a while. Yes. Just like us. See it now or, or don't yes. see it. You missed and, it. And the idea that um, things can be seen from different perspectives, okay. just like this piece. You know, you move yes. around it, it's different in every, from every, um, every vantage angle. point. Well, that's part of it, too. The materials are such that you look at them, and they change over time. You look at it 15, 20 years later, it's not quite the same piece. That's right. It's moved or mm -hmm. warped or mm -hmm. bent a little bit. It's mm -hmm. Just like the person. <laughs> Time has a way of doing that to people. It changes them. So where are you showing anywhere right now? Right now my work is in uh, the decor of a museum in Boston in a show called Body and Soul. The contemporary, uh, I think it's called Body and Soul, Contemporary Art and Healing. This is a group of 19 artists from all around the United States who work one way or another with art as healing, some for healing themselves of serious disease, some to create healing environments or spaces or pieces, and some like my work that actually try to make 
a change. Okay, now how does this heal someone? I'm not sure that it does, Jim, but I think that there is a power in art. That art is powerful. Definitely. It, the way ceremony is. And I, I make a lot of work the way traditional peoples make ceremony. Now, is the ceremony a healing actually for you, or...? I started out that way. I wanted to change things about myself, and okay. it definitely helped me to make these images of empowerment, these images of healing. But... Um, Did it help? It definitely. I couldn't be here today sitting and talking to you about my work on a television if I hadn't made The Open Woman years ago. And it changed and your life. All of the pieces changed me. But what's so exciting is that when I meet someone and I say I'd really like to do a piece with you, I find out that I'm looking at something that is universal mm -hmm. so that it also affects me. That piece about anger, mm -hmm. Sharon's piece, the reflective piece, yes. the piece about looking inward. So it makes you look also. Absolutely. And it brings you out as it brings them out, seeing themselves. So every piece that I do is also about myself. So I've you just actually learned that. take these people on a journey with you. I guess that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I like that way of putting it. Opening doors, mm -hmm. moving through together instead of uh, solo. It is about connecting with others. The piece that I made, The Tree of Life, that involved 600 people, is connecting with that as many as I could. certainly is, 600 people. Yeah. And that's not even the people that came to see no. and uh, participate. No, that was people who sent parts, uh, um, their cast hands, for a piece that I installed in, in a gallery in Providence. Now, do you, we only have about a minute left. I was wondering if you have anything to say for people out there that might be following this course and uh, interested. Well, certainly making art can be transformative. And I, uh, sometimes when someone comes to me and says, I'd like to, you to do a piece about um, childhood sexual abuse or something like that, I suggest to them that they make their own art because the ceremony of it and the cathartic feeling that it gives them will help them. I don't know if it can always heal, but it's certainly something that it's a tool for us to use. So it brings it out into the open so you can see it. That helps a great deal. And, and it's not locked inside anymore. Yes. And then to make a positive image of where you want to be yeah. is something that is healing. Oh, wow. That's very, that's very good. I, I'll do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've really learned a lot. And um, I want, yes, I want more contact. I want to see more. Maybe we need to do a, a portrait about you. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. <laughs> I have to wallow a while, I think. But it sounds, it sounds fun. We should, yeah. Or something. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. I had a great time. Thank you. All right. Uh, this has been Art Talk. I'm your host, Jim Tripp. And you've just seen Christiane Corbett in action. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.